Welcome students. Uh, we want to discuss about a uh, few more multiplicative functions. Until now, we have uh, discussed about uh, Euler uh, phi function or Euler torsion function. Uh, we want to discuss about two more, uh, two more multiplicative function, sum and the divisor function. Okay, so sum of divisor functions and divisor functions. So, uh, so in this uh, discussion, the following theorem will be useful from 3.7, that if m and n are relatively prime positive integers, that means m and n are prime, and if d divides m n, then this d can be decomposed or uh, can be then d can be decomposed as multiples of divisor d1 and d2 where d1 is a divisor of m and d2 is a divisor of of n yeah. and conversely if d1 and d2 are divisors of m and n then d equals to d1 d2 is a divisor for positive integer m n so if d1 divides so let me write that down again if d divides m n then there exist unique d1 d2 such that d1 divides m and d2 divides n with and what do we get out of that we get d equals to d1 d2 right and conversely also this is true that means if d1 and d2 are divisors of m and n then d1 times d2 is a positive divisor of mn all right so all the divisors are positive here so um, so now comes a discussion about two functions. So one is the sum of divisor functions denoted by sigma, and the notation is sigma n. So it's an arithmetic function, and it's defined by sum of all positive divisors of n. So let me give an example. Say suppose you have sigma of, uh, so let's take one. So sigma of one is, set of all positive divisors of, so let this be n, we have sigma n. So in this case, sigma n would be one. If you have two, how many divisors of two exist? Two and one, so it's one plus two, which is three. Then we are looking at uh, uh, three, so divisors of this is basically one plus the next divisor is three, which is four. What about divisors of four? So the divisor, sum of divisors is gonna be one is a divisor, two is a divisor, and then four is a divisor. So this is going to be seven and uh, five, let's see. So it's gonna be one plus five, which is six. And uh, six, the device, sum of device is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 6. So this is going to be 12. And then the process continues. So this function is sum of divisor function. Now there is another function which is interesting. Uh, the number of divisor functions, which is denoted by sigma. And it counts the number of positive divisors of n. So let's look at an example. So so tau of n is the number of positive divisors of this guy. So what is the number of positive divisors? Here we have number of positive divisor is one. In this case, there are two divisors. So it's gonna be one, one, so two. So now how many divisors are here? In this case, we have one and three. So there are again two. And in this case, we have one, two, and three divisors. So this is gonna be three. For this again, we have two, and for this we have one, two, three, four. Okay. Now note that for certain uh, sigmas can be written very easily. Uh, let's say for example, if p is prime, p prime, then we have sigma n is gonna be p plus one, and tau n is gonna be two. Yeah, namely you have two divisors here, p and one. 
So now uh, we want to prove that sigma and tau are multiplicated. So for that, we'll prove the following result in, in, in generality, which is the following. If f is a multiplicative function, then the summatory function. So what is the summatory function? Summatory function is defined as summation uh, f of n. So capital F is a summatory function of f if it is defined by sum of f of d, where d ranges over the divisors of n. Okay, so this is what the summatory function is. And this theorem says that if, if basically, if f is multiplicated, then the summatory function f is also multiplicated. So this is what we want to prove. So let's write down the proof of this. So what do we want to prove uh, by this is if m and n are co-prime, then f of m n equals to f of n times f of n. This is what we want to, to show. So, uh, so let's find out what is f of mn. f of mn is summation d dividing mn f of d. Now note, because of the result we have here, we are looking at divisors of mn, right? And divisors of mn can be decomposed as d1 times d2, where d1 is divisor of m and d2 is divisor of n, yeah? So let me write that statement down. So uh, each divisor of m and n times n can be written uniquely as product of co-prime divisors d1 of m and d2 of n. Yeah, so these divisors also will be co-prime. Right. So, yeah, that follows from this theorem here. Yeah. So unique pair of this conversely. So here I should have mentioned in this that with, with what? With D1 and D2 equals to one. Right. Because if they are not one, then M and N will have a common factor. Right. It's bigger than one. So that is not true. So therefore we have this. So now uh, we have, so therefore f of mn can be written as summation. Instead of d, I'm going to replace it with d1 and d2. So d1, which divides m, d2, which divides n, yeah, f of d1, d2. Now I can basically, since this is going to be summation d1, divides m and d2 divides n of f of d1 f of d2 d1 divides m d2 divides n f of d1 f of d2 and the justification for that is since d1 d2 are co-prime and f is multiplicative, right? F is multiplicative. All right, so now I can break this as double sum. So I can write it as summation d1 divides m f of d1 times summation d2 divides n f of d2, right? Because this sum is over all d1s and d2s, right? So now this one is f of m. And by definition, this is f of m. 
therefore f is multiplicative so now so we have proved uh, this result is very uh, useful in all the applications of multiplicative function that a summatory function of multiplicative function is a multiplicative function so now what is the upshot of this so upshot of this is now we can prove that the sum of divisor functions sigma and tau are multiplicative function how are we going to do that we are going to write them as uh, as summatory function so let's go back to the definition of sigma sigma is basically sigma of n is d divides n of d so we can write down sigma n equals to summation d divides n of f of n where f of n equals to n right so f of n equals to n uh, and you can see that f of d is then d right so this will replace by the so now note note f is multiplicative right why because it's actually it's completely multiplicative not just multiplicative you don't even need that mnn to be co prime but every completely multiplicative function so so it's basically completely multiplicative it's also multiplicative and i'm using that property so um what do i get this implies sigma n is multiplicative again by theorem about now similarly let's look at tau of n tau of n is summation d divides n of 1 that can be written as summation d divides n of h of n where h of n is 1 right so and since h of n is multiplicative again h of n is also completely multiplicative so h of n is multiplicative this implies this implies uh since it's multiplicative it's multiplicative and which gives from theorem about tau of n is multiplicative from theorem about from theorem about now the 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 big feature of multiplicative function is hence enough to evaluate hence so the philosophy is the following let me write down the philosophy loosely speaking is for multiplicative functions it is enough to know no their values or their behavior at prime t or prime power right it is enough to know their behavior at p to the power a right and then we can basically using the multiplicativity we can we can understand all not what happens at all positive integers so here is a uh, in that regards let's study the following let p be a prime and a be a positive integer then sigma of p to the a is 1 plus p plus p square dot 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 p plus a which is this part here and sigma of p to the a is a plus 1 so this is uh, obvious why is that because what are the divisors of p to the a so divisors of all the divisors of p to the a are 1 p p square all the way until p to the power a right so how many of them are there there are a of these a the number is a so therefore sigma of p to the a 
is going to be 1 plus p plus p square dot 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 plus p to the a and if you use the following formula 1 plus x plus dot 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 x to the power n minus 1 is same as x to the n minus 1 divided by x minus 1 we can see that this is going to be e to the power a plus 1 minus 1 upon p minus 1 and since there are a of these you can see that tau of e to the power a is a plus 1. Now the next result consequently follows from the fact so this result follows from the the uh, the functions being multiplicative and knowing the values at prime so let n be a positive integer with prime factorization this so sigma of n so one sigma of n is going to be sigma of p1 to the power a1 dot 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 ps to the power as uh, which is going to be sigma of p1 to the power a1 dot 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 ps to the power as sigma of this and what is the justification for this justification is that pi a i and p j a j are co prime if p i is not equal to p j right because if the primes are distinct yeah the, then then they are co prime so now we have already computed these on the top here so if we use the result from the above we get p 1 to the power a 1 plus 1 minus 1 upon p minus 1 dot 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 P s to the power a s plus 1 minus 1 upon p s minus 1 and similarly we get tau of n is tau of p 1 to the power a 1 dot 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 p s to the power a s which is going to be tau of p 1 a 1 tau of p s a s I should have said this that these are one and sigma is multiplicative, right? So, and the reason for that is again the same because pi to the power ai, pj to the power aj is one if i is not equal to j. Yeah, this is because of the decomposition, the way we have written. We have written it in a way that when you write a prime factorization the pi's are distinct right so we get this is uh, early on computed as a1 plus 1 dot 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 as plus 1 so these are the properties of your multiplicative function sum of the divisors and the number of divisors so we understand the behavior of them now let's uh, investigate the sum of divisor function a little bit in detail. The sum of divisors of a number n excluding the number itself is called aliquot sum. If it's equal to n itself, then we call such a number as perfect numbers. So um, if you look at say sigma of six, so or if you want to look at the aliquot sum, let's call this as sigma one of n. So it is basically sigma one of n is essentially the same thing. All d divides n of d, but d is not n. So you're looking at the proper divisors of it. Yeah. So if you look at sigma one of of six is going to be one plus two plus Three, which is six. Now let's look at sigma one of fourteen. This is going to be one plus two plus seven. Hmm. So one plus two plus seven is not fourteen, right? So this is not the case. What about sigma of twenty-eight? So I'm looking at some examples. So sigma of 28 is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 
47 plus 14. And now if you add this up, you will see that it is 7 plus 7, so another, so this is going to be 28. So these numbers are perfect numbers. However, if you don't want to bring another kind of sum in the game, uh, note that uh, if you have sigma n, that is same as sigma 1 of n, aliquot sum plus n. So we can change the definition of perfect numbers. Uh, there's a lot of history behind it, by the way. So um, n is a positive integer, then sigma of n of n, sigma of n is 2n, then n is called a perfect number. So this, so these two are examples of perfect number, all right? So now let's uh, investigate uh, how can we, so question, can we find out all the perfect numbers? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, let's basically uh, use the following theorem to say, when is an even number, a perfect even number, okay? So, so the theorem is the following. If n is a perfect number, even perfect number, if and only if n is two to the power m minus one, two to the power m minus one again, but this is in the power, and this is two to the power m minus one is prime. And so we need that n has to be of this form along with the fact that two to the power m minus one is prime, then we have n is an even perfect number. Okay, so let's see. So, so we'll prove this way. So to show two to the power m minus one. Here we need that m has to be greater than or equal to two, otherwise we won't get an even number, right? So two to the power m minus one times two to the power m minus one dn with two to the power m minus one a prime. To show given so given this so we are given this to show sigma of n is 2n and n is even so n is even is clear why because the power of m m is greater than or equal to 2 so since m is greater than or equal to 2 2 to the power m minus 1 is even. This implies 2 to the power m minus 1 times 2 to the power m minus 1 is even. Okay. So the, the evenness follows right away. The, the second thing is to show that it is perfect. So let's compute. So sigma of 2 to the power m minus 1, 2 to the power m minus one is equal to sigma of two to the m minus one times two to the power m minus. One. Now, why is that sigma of this? Why is that note two to the power m minus one is greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to, uh, is greater than or equal to when because m is two, so this is gonna be greater than or equal to three is a prime. Hence it's odd, right? And so, so this implies what two to the m minus one and two to the m minus one. These are co-prime and sigma is, and sigma is what? Sigma is multiplicative. This is equal to so, and sigma is, and sigma is multiplicated. If I combine all this fact, this is what I get. Okay. Now, so, all right. But now what is sigma of two to the power m minus one? We have already seen the formula for p to the power, p to the power a is, 
p to the power a is p to the power a plus one minus one upon p minus one. So two to the power m minus one would be two to the power m minus one plus one minus one divided by two minus one. So that is the first part. And this is a prime. So for prime, we have also seen that for prime, the, the sigma of n is gonna be p plus one. So this is going to be p plus one, which is uh, two to the n. And this can be simplified as two to the power m minus one. Let me bring this in front here. So this can be seen as two to the power m minus one times two. And then rearranging, I get two times two to the m minus one times two to the m minus one, which is two n. So therefore, therefore what n is perfect. or n is even perfect number. Now we want to basically prove the converse statement. The converse statement is let n be a perfect number, even perfect number. perfect number and even. So we want to show that it can be decomposed like this. It can be decomposed as two to the power m minus one times two to the m minus one, where this part is a prime. So let's work on that. So if n is a perfect number and it's even, this implies n equals to two to the power s t s times t, where of course s is greater than or equal to one, and uh, t is odd. Yeah. Okay. So now we have sigma of n equals to two to the power sigma of two to the power s times sigma of t, yeah, since, since we have, since two to the s and t are co-prime. Why one is even, so one is all powers of two and t is an odd number, so they cannot have any common factor, right? The only common factors which is possible between the first one, first one, all the factors are two. For this part, all the factors are two with, and there are no such factors for t. So they are co-prime. So let's compute this. So this is gonna be two to the power, sigma of S is going to be two to the power S plus one times sigma two to the power S. So this is basically two to the power S minus one divided by two minus one times sigma T. This is a formula. So this is going to be two to the power s plus one minus one times sigma t. And this is equal to two n. Yeah, that is given. That means that is, this is equal to two times two to the power s so two to the power s plus two to the power s times t, which is going to be two to the power s plus one times t. So these two are equal. So this is equal to, this is equal to this. Now let's see what is the upshot of that. So we get therefore, Therefore, we get 
2 to the power s plus 1 minus 1 times sigma t is going to be 2 to the power s plus 1 times t. Now, since 2 to the power s plus 1 minus 1 and 2 to the s plus 1 are co-prime, this implies what happens then? In this case, these are co-prime, so we'll get that 2 to the power s plus 1 must divide this because it's co-prime with this part. So we get 2 to the power s plus 1 divides sigma t. Now that would mean, so if divides that implies there exist q, and again, all these are positive, so q belonging Q, there exists Q, uh, uh, a positive integer, such that we have 2 to the power s plus 1 times Q equals to sigma t. Now, let's substitute this back. So let's call this as star. So we have let's call this as hash sub hash into star. So if we substitute that we get 2 to the power s plus 1 minus 1 now instead of sigma t, I'm going to write 2 to the power s plus 1 times q equals to 2 to the power s plus 1 times t. So this implies by cancellation 2 to the power s plus 1 minus 1 times q equals to t. Now, to show, we'll show that to show q is 1. Yeah. Why? If q is not, if q is not 1, then uh, 1 will imply, equation 1 implies 2 to the power s plus 1 times q minus q equals to t which means 2 to the power s plus 1 times q uh, equals to t plus q. Okay. Now, what do we get out of this? So t plus q, and uh, that is, but that from hash, this is equal to sigma t from hash. So we have the following. So sigma t equals to this, on one hand. On the other hand, if you look at hash from hash, actually from, so from, from one and from one, we can see that divisors of T are first of all T itself, then there's one and there's Q. If Q is not one, right? this would imply sigma of t is going to be bigger than, it will consist of some of these divisors for sure, and maybe something more. So from two and three, so three contradicts two. Therefore, q must be one. So therefore we get Q must be one. And in that case, we get T equals to two to the power. So from here, Q must be one. So we get T to the power S plus one minus one from one. However, that also makes a point that uh, we get um, Sigma of T is 
what do we get sigma of t in this case? So if this is one from one again, we get sigma of t actually from, from two, from two, we get sigma of t equals to t plus q. So we get sigma of t equals to t plus one, which implies what? Which implies sigma, which implies t is a prime. So that proves our result. So therefore two to the power. So what is my t? Therefore two to the power s plus one minus one is a So this proves the whole thing. So now primes like these are special. They have a lot of history behind them. And these are called Marseille primes. Anyway, we'll come to that. Let's look at the following theorem. So let M be a positive integer and two to the M is a prime, then M must be a prime, okay? So if M is not a prime, then it's gonna be composite. And that we can use the decomposition. So if M is not a prime, not a prime, then M equals to AB with one and B both less than M. And in that case, we get two to the power M minus one can be written as two to the power a, the whole power b minus one, which is two to the power a minus one, two to the power a times b minus one, two to the power a times b minus two, dot, 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 two to the power a plus one. Since a is greater than one, two to the power a is greater than greater than what? So a is, a is greater than one, then two to the power a is greater than equal to two to the power two. This implies two to the power a minus one is greater than equal to three. So this is non-trivial factor, right? So we have since two to the power a minus one is bigger than one. And similarly, you can show that this part is also bigger than one. And of course they are less than two to the power m minus one. This implies two to the power m minus one is not a prime. Which contradiction, right? Therefore, m must be a prime. So this motivates the following definition. If M is a positive integer, then M N, which is two to the power M minus one is called Mth Mersenne number. So this is in honor of a, 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 a French monk, Marin Mersenne. Marin with an R. Marin Mersenne. And he was basically 17th century. And there are so there were some theological reasons for studying these primes as well, if I recall correctly. So if P is a prime, and on top of that, MP is a prime, then we call MP as Mth Marseille prime, right? So just because P is prime doesn't mean that MP is gonna be prime, right? But if that also happens, then we have MP is, uh, is, is a Mersenne prime. So let me give an example. For example, let's look at F7, which is two to the power seven minus one, which is going to be, uh, so two to the power seven minus one is, which is 127, and that can be seen as a prime, all right? I mean, like, how do you check if it's a prime? It's a good idea to use your, maybe you can use trial or uh, division method to see that it's a prime. Yeah, um, uh, so you only have to go into the square root of 125 uh, and uh, square root of 125 
yeah so that is pi cubed so something which is near so you can only you need to only go until so until uh, 11 right to check so 11 doesn't goes in it you can check that 7 doesn't goes in it uh, 5 of course not 3 because you add the digits it's not so therefore this is a prime right however not all of them are prime so let's say n11 is uh, 211 minus 1 and uh, that is basically 2047 which is 23 times 89 is not prime so until now only 51 or 51 mersenne primes are unknown all right so now we want to understand uh to decide uh, we want basically to decide whether the given mersin prime number is a prime or not all right so for that we have the following if p is an odd prime then any divisor of mersin number mp note that it will be called mersin number until it is it is basically evaluated uh, uh, elevated to the level of being prime right so the, the theorem says that any divisor is going to be of form 2 to the power so 2kp plus 1 so let's see why is that the case so let q be a prime with q dividing mp that is q dividing 2 to the power p minus 1 so we know that for first of all by fermat's little theorem we know that Q divides 2 to the Q minus 1 minus 1. This is Fermat's little theorem. Fermat's little theorem. So there and then we have therefore 2 to the power P minus 1 and 2 to the power Q minus 1 are, is basically going to be 2 to the power P times P comma Q minus 1. Minus one, right? So we get because now since Q divides, so Q divides, Q divides two to the Q minus one, and Q divides two to the P minus one. This implies uh, uh, this implies two to the power P minus one uh, two to the power p minus 1 2 to the power q minus 1 uh, minus 1 these are going to be uh, the gcd of this is going to be greater than 1 yeah but but what do we have but p and q minus 1 the gcd is p right because why because otherwise the only possibility is uh, on the only other possibility is that it is one right it's one or p p or one so but since it is greater than one so we have this is the case and then consequently we get we get this implies p divides q minus one therefore q minus 1 equals to some mp for some positive integer m or in other words we get uh, we get q equals to mp plus 1 now so from there we can see but we have that m is also going to be so q is a prime so m is going to be r even right so since so m also some positive integer m which is even say m equals to 2k so this means i can write this as 2k p plus 1 and that proves our result okay. so now note there are a lot of uh, 
interesting results to find out the whether a given prime given uh, Mersenne number is prime or not. Uh, however, uh, it is exhaustive. Um, um, you can use, um, uh, uh, there is a theorem by, so you can look at Lucas Lemmer. So Lucas Lemmer test to, it's an algorithm to find out uh, whether the given number uh, given Mersenne number is prime or not. All right, so let's move on to the next part of the discussion. So welcome uh, to Mobius inversion and uh, Mobius function. So the motivation behind this problem is the following. Suppose I write my summatory function, which is d divides n f of d. So can I invert this? Can we invert this? What do I mean by that? Can I write my f of n equals to something times capital F of D? So this is what will culminate into, uh, this is the motivation for Mobius, one of the small motivations for Mobius function. So, uh, so again, what is a Mobius function? So Mobius function mu is defined for positive integers. Uh, it's basically uh, a function from, again, an arithmetic function from minus, uh, from z to minus one, zero, or one. Namely, it's defined as as follows. So mu of n is one if n is one. If n is not one, then it's product of primes or product of prime powers. So if it's product of distinct primes, then it is minus one to the power r and it's zero otherwise. So this prime power guarantees that what that there's no prime p such that p to the power p square divides n. Yeah. So distinct, so I should say p1, p2, pr. So the powers of prime should also be one. Huh? Yeah. So it should be product of distinct primes. Then we get uh, it to be minus one to the power r. So this is the uh, the Mobius function. All right, so we can look at some values. So what is mu of one? Mu of one is one. What is mu of two is basically minus one to the power of one because there's only one prime factor. Mu of, of three is again going to be minus one to the power of one. Mu of four is going to be what? Minus one to the power is, is false in the otherwise case. So it's gonna be zero. Mu of five again is going to be uh, minus one to the power one, mu of six is going to be, uh, mu of six is going to be minus one, how many prime factors are there? Two times three, so this is going to be, and these are non-square, so this is gonna be two, which is one. Mu of seven is going to be, again, minus one to the power one. Mu of eight is going to be zero. Why? Because there's a square dividing it, right? Two square divides it. Yeah. Mu of nine is also zero and so on. So now we want to show that this mu is also a multiplicative function. So how do we prove this? So to prove that, suppose we have, so we want to show if M and N are co-prime. We want to show to show to show mu of M N equals to mu of M times mu of N. Now case we'll split this case by case because case by case analysis is easier. Case one. m equals to one or n equals to one. Yeah, so when m equals to one, then this implies mu of mn is same as mu of one times n, which is mu of n, which is same as mu of one times mu of n, which is mu of n times mu of n. So same thing can be done for, same thing can be done for, why is that? Because mu of one is one. 
right? So same case, case for n equals to one is similar. So you have dealt the case when either one of them is one. So now case two, case two, if uh, either one of them is divisible by what? If either one of them have a, have a, a, a square divisor, all right? So either one of them have a square divisor. So if either one of them have a square divisor, so either one of them have a square divisor, have a P square dividing them, then say, P square divides M without loss of generality, then you will have mu of MN uh, is going to be, first of all, zero, since P square divides M, this implies P square divides MN, which is also same as what, uh, and P square divides M, which is same as mu of M, Why is that? Because mu of m is zero and zero times, okay. this is also zero, right? Because since p squared divides m, since p squared divides. So here I should write, since p squared divides this, we have mu of mn is zero and also p squared divides m, which gives me mu of m is zero. So the case where either of one of them have a square divisor of them, then we get that mu of mn is mu of m times mu of m. Now case three, that uh, m and n are square free. So if they both are square free, then your m can be written as p1 to the power, well, one, right? Because there's no square dot 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 p to the power r n can be written as q1 dot 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 qs and uh, we have these are distinct primes distinct primes these are also distinct primes now since m and n are co-prime this implies mn equals to p1 to pr q1 to QS and all these primes are distinct because if the primes are not distinct, they will show up in the GCD, right? All primes are distinct primes, product of distinct primes. So this would mean mu of MN is going to be minus one to the power. How many primes are there here? R plus S, that is same as minus one to the power R times minus one to the power s. However, this is same as mu of m, so mu of m, right? So therefore mu is multiplicative. Right. Now note that the summatory function, if you sum mu of d, it satisfies a very nice property namely that mu, if d divides n mu of d is either one if n is equal to one and zero if n is greater than one. So let's prove this proof. If n is equal to one, then we have f of d equals to summation d divides one of mu of d, which is same as mu of one, which is one. Now let's look at uh, any prime power. So since it's multiplicative, since mu is multiplicative, check for, so consider 
n equals to p to the power k in that case mu of n is going to be one plus minus one to the power sorry summation of mu n d divides n is going to be minus one to the power is going to be let me write that down is going to be mu of one plus mu of p plus mu of p square dot 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 mu of p to the power k and now none of these are square free so they are zero since these have these have these are not square free are not square free so since these are not square free and here we get so mu of one is one and mu of p is minus one to the power one. So this is gonna be zero. So therefore, p to the power n equals to p to the power k. So this is gonna be zero. Moment, all you need is that you need. So mu of p to the power i is zero for all i greater than or equal to two. Yeah. Now, if you have n equals to p one to the power a one dot 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 p k to the power a k, note that f of d is a summatory function function of a multiplicated function. Therefore, f of d is multiplicated, or f of the n is multiplicated. So we will have what we will have. F of n equals to f of p one to the power a one dot 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 f of p k to the power a k. So what do we get? We get here, so, so here we got, if you look at this guy, f of d. So if you had f of d, so we have f of k, f of p to the power k is zero if k is greater than or equal to one, right? Yeah, even with this you get, so we get this equals to so in this factorization, we get this equals to zero because it's also multiplicative, right? So here I should have said that uh, it's not that mu is multiplicative, f is multiplicative. So this proves that if you add them up, you get this. Now here comes the Mobius inversion formula. So Mobius inversion formula tells you the following. Suppose f is an arithmetic function and that f is a summatory function of this. So we already know that this capital F is also summatory. So this capital F, which is a summatory function, is also multiplicative, right? But that's not the point. The point is then I can write my F of D in terms of F of N over D times mu D, summation D divides N. Okay. So this is called Mobius inversion formula. So you invert it. I'll post the video of this uh, soon. So this leads us to the last discussion. So if f is an arithmetic function with the summatory function f, then capital F is multiplicative, then so is f, yeah? So how do we get? So we got f of n is summation d divides n f of d right we have shown that what so we know that f is multiplicative yeah we have proved this result yes see theorem above yeah now we are able to write down this f of d or f of n now using mobius inversion this can be written as so 
So we get f of n is summation d divides n mu of d times f of n over d. So now these, these functions are multiplicative and the product of multiplicative function is multiplicative. Therefore, yeah, therefore the result follows. Okay, so we can do that right away. Here, we want to show that if you have this, if f is multiplicative, then f is also multiplicative. So let's see that. So we have, let, uh, we want to show, so to show f is multiplicative. Yeah, so we are starting with what? We are starting with given f equals to d and f is multiplicative. So that's what is given to us, all right? The, the multiplicative of small f is not given to you and you want to prove that. To show that f is multiplicative, let's compute f of mn, which is summation d divides mn mu of d f of mn divided by d. Now I can break this up as summation d1 divides m d2 divides n of mu of d1. So d2 dividing n mu of d1 d2 f of m n divided by d1 d2 this is going to be, uh, now we can break it into double sum. So take all D1s dividing M. Now this is multiplicative, so I can break it as mu of D1 times mu of D2. I'm gonna basically write it like that. Then I have F of M dividing D1 and F of N dividing D2. And then I can break this summation. This is going to be your F of N and this is your f of n. So therefore, m and n are. So here we have relied on the following fact that m and n are co-prime, and then only I can break it in terms of divisors like this. Right? Okay, so thank you for your attention.